The webinar is now live. We opened the floodgates just a little bit early so we could get some people in here to come hang out when we get ready for showtime. So hi, everyone, jumping in. Of course, I spelled Kyle's name wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I love this excitement. I love the all caps, caps lock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've been trying to push it like on MSPG Cavalry. We want to get people revved up for it. Cool. We're going we're gonna to have some fun. I mean, I agree. I'm not a caps lock guy personally. I feel like it's completely useless. Yeah, I was just thinking like, yeah, I don't, what the heck is caps lock? (laughs) (laughs) Map it to something else like control or alt. Just keep it. Yeah. The one time I use caps lock is when I need to turn it off because I accidentally turned it on and I'm like, why is everything coming out wrong? (laughs) Yeah. Cool. I'm happy to see everyone jumping in. Uh, If you do want to be chatting with us, please be sure to use that chat setting switch to all panelists and attendees so we can get the the community going oh the wall honeycomb yeah i don't know this was a christmas present but it is nice and fun we can kind of change the light colors and make them go all different things but i'm keeping it the huntress teal welcome everybody we'll give it just a few more moments until we hit right at the top of the hour and we can kick things off, nerd out for a little bit. Oh yeah, we can switch it to some MSP Geek Navy Orange. I don't know how well it'll look. Like how, do, how well does it pick up? <laughs> oh, it looks pretty good on my, account, on my uh, camera, but I'm also colorblind, so I don't know if that really counts. We gotta make it so like the chat can control what color is gonna be up and displayed. Make it fun. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Got an API, right? We can tie something in. Oh, hey, Martin's colorblind too. All righty. Well, I'm thinking we're at the top of the hour. So what do you say, Mindy? Should we kick this thing off? Yeah, let's get into it. All right. Well, hey, if you are jumping in, please, 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 uh, you want to chat with us, you want to chat with everyone, set the Zoom chat setting to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see you talk and have some cool conversation and chatter. Um, if you have questions for us, and we're going to make some time for questions and answers at the very end of the show, please, again, use that Zoom Q&A feature that you should be able to find at the very bottom of the window there. Uh, yes, I do see one question immediately by anonymous attendee. And they're asking, hey, I've got to drop out real quick. Sorry, will this be recorded? Yes, we are absolutely recording. We're recording right now. So say hi to mom, you're on the internet. And uh, I think we can just dive in. Yeah, let's go for it. All right. So I will share my screen. How's it look? Can you guys see my screen? It looks good on my end. Okay, cool. <laughs> You're the I'm only like, one no I can get No one's responding in chat, guys. From. Come on. What happened here? <laughs> there we go. Martin says it looks good. One raise hand. Excellent, excellent. I'll get the chat open as well so I can see and there do is some banter. All right. So it's better internet. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> go ahead. So if you couldn't tell, obviously, we're here to have fun. Uh, this is meant to be kind of a cool, casual, informal, friendly show and presentation. Um, So please don't hesitate, jump in the chat, have some fun, have some questions for us and uh, be a part of this because we're here to nerd out and do some cool, fun, technical geek stuff, right? So this is a presentation. This is a talk titled, Don't Judge a Book by Its Cover or Don't Judge a PDF by Its Cover. Don't Judge a Book or a PDF by Its Cover. So, hey, hi, hello, it's me. Uh, My name is John Hammond. I'm a security researcher over at Huntress, and I am flattered and super excited to be joined by my good friend, Mendy, here. Hey, guys. Um, I am the CTO of Intellicom Technologies and a managing admin of MSP Geek, one of the managing admins of MSP Geek. Um, And I am more flattered and excited to be joined by John, (laughs) who does this all the time, and I only do it part-time. Um, but just to give you a little background, so like 
this is a what we call on MSP Geek is a geek cast. Um, it's the first one from the vendor side of MSP Geek. Uh, MSP Geek is a community where uh, we try to raise the tide, so to speak. It's one of our core values, right? Raising, a raising tide raises all ships. A rising tide raises all ships. Um, and the idea is, is that we help everyone uh, grow their business. We help everyone become better technically, improve their skill sets. We want to we want to improve communications across vendor and MSP. Um, so we are an open, free community for MSPs and service providers to connect to each other, to you know pick up best practices and whatnot, as well as con to connect to other vendors. Huntress, who was one of our first vendors on MSP Geek, is a amazing company. Um, I, every single person I've talked to at Huntress, I've walked away feeling like I got more out of it than I gave. <laughs> and the company themselves are always on top of the security and the landscape, and they're always doing things, even for companies that are not necessarily their customers, they're always on top of any kind of security incident. Um, and then their actual platform they provide is a great threat detection, uh, persistence detection, um, for any kind of malware that, that leaves behind any footprints on, um, on systems. Uh, currently, Windows only, I think, of Mac is in progress or whatever. Um, but Huntress is our first vendor for January for this year who will be doing a GeekCast with MSP Geek. And uh, John and I planned out this cast, and hopefully it goes well. <laughs> Fingers crossed, right? Fingers crossed, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Well, thanks so much. That's super flattering and, and super sweet. We really appreciate that. So. Yeah, well, that's what you do. So I just have to say the truth, man. <laughs> We're both here like fanboying over each other. This is- this I know, is... <laughs> all right, let's move on, let's move on. Right. Let's Next get slide. into it. <laughs> sweet. So today's agenda, we wanted to put this together that's something that's still approachable, something that's still friendly, something that anyone can kind of just get into and, and learn something. Uh, but we also still wanted to strike that balance with showcasing something really cool and having some fireworks in there and doing some magic tricks. So hopefully we got that right, but hey, it's up to you, you're the judge. But what are we gonna be talking about today? So we'll get kind of the, the foundation out of the way first. We'll talk about the bare bone basics, like tilling the ground for what we're gonna be talking about, but file contents, what makes up a file? When we have this talk and presentation titled, don't judge a book or a PDF by its cover. Okay, we're talking about PDF files, right? But not just PDF files, but PNG files, image files, JPEGs, or music files, audio, .mp3, even video, .mkv, AVI, whatever you want. What makes that file a file? How does your computer know? And why does it open up a program and what program does it open up and how does it know to do that? That's kind of what we want to get into. So file associations, understanding how that works within the Windows registry. And we'll do a little bit of a, a fun demo, hopefully. We'll get to see some of those magic tricks and fireworks. But then we'll end the thing off with some lessons learned and we'll open the floor for Q&A. So I think that's it. I think that's the good wrap up. What, what say you, Mandy? Yeah, I think you covered everything. <laughs> All right, cool. Let's get the boilerplate out of the way. Let's talk about file contents. But this introduces some idea that I will probably beat to death. <laughs> and I think we'll both kind of beat like the dead horse here. We'll, I want to drive home this idea that what makes a file? Well, it's just data. Like everything is just data. So whether or not you're looking at letters or whether or not you're looking at numbers, whether or not that's ABC, one, two, three, or even any like bytes that's not printable, that's not English character, but something that you could actually, your computer will understand, that is still data. It's just kind of presented and in a different shape or different form. So sure, we look at plain text. Like if we had a message, hi, hello, I'm here with Mendy. Well, that could very well be represented in a different way in the ASCII character set, or maybe represented in a different format or binary, right? One and two, zero, excuse me, zeros and ones, zero and base one. two. 
all right, we're already we're already off to a good start. I'm calling binary the wrong thing. Yeah, I know. I was like, <laughs> what? Hexadecimal, right? And we'll get into that in a little bit. But whether or not a file is executable, well, it's kind of different in the realms of, of Windows and Linux, right? Windows, it'll just kind of know based off of the file extension and what will open it and execute it. But in Linux, you can mark something as executable. Um, I've just tried to highlight this kind of on the right-hand side with this image, with this picture here. I'm over in a Linux rendition inside of Windows just so I can kind of use some quicker commands. But say I have a plain text message, right? We could look at that in hex. And that's that 506C6169. It's the exact same data, but just in a different way. So when we talk about binary, we talk about base 16, even when we talk about octal base eight, well, that's still the same data, just represented in a different format. I have this little joke up here, and I don't know, some of you might've heard it already. Oct 31 is really tech 25. 25. Is that Halloween is the same as Christmas? So yeah, octal base eight, right? That representation of that number 31 is still gonna be equivalent to decimal 25. And when we talk about decimal, we count on our fingers, right? It's base 10. Right. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten digits in that space. Have you seen? Uh, do you work with Python all that much, Mendy? Um, I make fun of Python a lot when oh. I talk to Kyle. You're but... killing me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I mean, I do, I do make fun of Python a lot, but mostly it's to rile Kyle up. I've I've done some work in in Python. Python is uh, near and dear to my heart, but uh, in, in this case, we're I, over in this right-hand image, I'm opening and tinkering with that message file, file that yep. we just saw. And there's the data, right? The plain text data that we saw before, but in hex, just as we kind of saw earlier, that 506C61, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. But again, in binary, 10101100, zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, et cetera. Right. All the same data, same thing. Have we have we beaten that idea to death yet? Um, I think so. I just I just want to reaffirm for people who just in case you were like spacing out the the bottom line here is that the different types of data doesn't change what the data actually is, right? You have the same string, the same words, plain text data, or hello world, or hi, any of that, just being converted into different formats. They're almost like different languages, kind of. Um, I mean, and they're called, um, you know, the, the different the different types of data. It is it's either, like you said, binary or hex or uh, plain text. So just just remember that it's actually the same exact data. And if you were to convert one to the other, you know, oct, oct thirty one is actually decimal twenty five. I mean, that's that's literally what it is. Sweet. So then, how do we make this jump from data? this kind of blob of, of information, some amorphous thing. And how do we call that a file? Yeah, I mean, so it, what we have to realize is what, once you understand that the data is really the same, um, what actually makes a PDF different from an MP3? You know, like why is one different than the other? How come I can't open a PDF in Windows Media Player or you know, what other, whatever your favorite VLC, whatever your favorite player is, why can't you just run the PDF and then have it do stuff. Like if it's all the same stuff, what makes one file different from the other, right? Yeah. So what it comes out to is what you have on the slide is the file signature. Um, there's different types of files and each one is classified with a heading, I believe, right, John? Yeah, you can call it a header, you can call it a signature, you can call it the magic bytes. I guess it has a lot of kind of different names Words. and nomenclature. Yeah. They all mean the same thing, kind of like different types of data. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, so uh, what is this Gary Kessler's list that you have on there? Yeah, so when I, so I, I, I guess I'll go on a tangent and hopefully rope this back in, but <laughs> so I play a lot of capture the flag, right? Or we look at different malware and Huntress and sometimes we'll run across a file that doesn't have a file extension and we can't immediately know what it is because oftentimes us as people, we just kind of rely on the file extension. If it's a .png, okay, it's probably a picture, but it might not actually be because it's all data. Uh, 
so Windows in the Windows realm, I don't think, at least I haven't, I, ca- I haven't thought of one off the top of my head. It, it doesn't have a good utility to immediately identify what the file signature might be. Or looking at the data, what does it actually represent despite the file extension? Uh, so Linux has the file command mm-hmm. and that utility just kind of reads the first couple of bytes, the first snippet of data within that file. And then that's going to be that file signature or that header or those magic bytes that indicate, okay, this has the same structure as a PNG file or a PDF file. Um, I I included Gary Kessler's list in here because I tend to reference that quite a bit. This is a humongous dump of all the potential bytes and data that might be the very, very start of a specific file type or file extension. Um, So if I were to search for that PNG, you can see here's that portable network graphics file. It tends to start with these magic bytes and in hex, we saw that base 16 representation, but there's, okay, in ASCII or kind of represented the best it could, it spells out PNG. Right, and that's a key word, right? Best it could. So let's just harp on that for one second because you'll notice that a lot of the ASCII representation of a signature doesn't show up, right? It's just up as a dot or invalid character or something like that because there is no representation in ASCII for whatever that character or whatever that data is, I should say. Um, so when you're when you are comparing signatures or looking for a, for a signature of a specific file type, you may have to actually be focused on the hex, uh, so you can get the hex of the of the hex code of it, and then you can match that up to either uh, Gary Kessler's list or um, there's other databases online you can find. Um, but this one looks pretty extensive, so I don't know why you'd want to. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to zoom out here so you can get the full effect of uh, this thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that scroll bar is huge. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully that's a, maybe a tool in your toolkit we'll offer you. Cool. How is that? How, have, we, have we ingrained that thought into your head? If you have any questions about file signatures or types of files or data, feel free to post. All right. So now we understand and have named this blob of data and deemed it a file and how we can identify that file based off of the signatures, the header, those magic bytes. But now the next question is, okay, how does your computer, how does Windows actually know what to do with that specific file? How does it open up that image in an, in an image viewer or open up that Word document in Microsoft Word? Well, they're going to be associated with different programs, right? So I'm sure some of you have probably seen this setting maybe in the graphical user interface, right? In the control panel of Windows or some of these, is this Metro settings? Is that right? Yeah, the, Metro, the modern UI, the Metro oh. UI, they've changed the name on it so many times. The garbage UI, you can call it too. <laughs> Microsoft with their name changes, Defender, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> yeah, right. Anyway, we've got the control panel and here's some neat little setting where you can see, okay, off on the right-hand side, maybe there's that file extension. And then what program is the default application to open up that program? Uh, you could do this kind of on the fly. If you were to right-click a file and select open with, I'm sure you've done that before and you've seen that around, but ultimately that's kind of a wrap around more configuration settings pertinent to Windows and the core of the operating right. system. Right. We'll get into that in just a moment, but the GUI graphical user interface is one way to make those changes. Some of you other keyboard junkies might be more familiar with the command line interface and how you're gonna end up setting those associations. Do you tend to use these all that often, Mendy? Have you poked around with the kind of ASOC and F type commands? Oh yeah, I can say yeah and just be like, I always do that because I'm awesome. But no, I, I have honestly never heard of those commands before until I saw your slide, John, I'll be honest with you. Once I saw them on your slide, I was like, what the hell are those? And then I, <laughs> you know, I pulled them up on command line. I was like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, maybe I'll start using these. <laughs> um, but up until then, like I can, I can list, I and mean, it's one of my, honestly, it's one of my interview questions when we, when we interview a text, I'm like, oh, how many different ways do you know to associate a program, a file to a program? You know, and what exactly does that mean? 
Um, and they're like, oh, I can go right click and open with and then choose default or always use this program. But there are other ways through the interface that you can do it. And I've, I've just never even bothered thinking or because I never had to script it. <laughs> I never even bothered thinking about a command line method. Um, but both, both of those are pretty cool. I do see a question coming through in the chat. Like, hey, what about PowerShell? Do we get any love for, for PowerShell, how you can do it in that? Um, well, as I just admitted, I yeah. never had any experience on the command line, so I got no idea. <laughs> Off the top of my head, truth be told, I am not positive what the PowerShell syntax might be, but uh, we can leave that as an exercise for the reader. <laughs> you know, I would be, I was willing to bet without actually doing any real research on this, I'm willing to bet that PowerShell doesn't have an option to do this natively. Um, mostly because, and what we're going to find out later on in the next slide is that Microsoft is trying to move away from people changing this by themselves. Um, they're, they're trying to lock down the ability to change this via script. Um, and we'll, we'll, you'll see what we mean when the, on the next couple of slides, cause we tried. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, darn it. We tried. Anyway, uh, wanted to sprinkle that in. If you're interested in some of the old school DOS cmd.exe commands you could use to do this, um, ASOC and F-Type will by default just list out all the file associations. You can kind of see that again on the right-hand side. Uh, if you supply other parameters or arguments, you can actually set one file extension to be mapped to something. Uh, and then honestly, kind of as we said in Windows 10 currently, your mileage may vary, uh, but it is something to, to tinker and, and, and play with. So feel free to take a look at some of those commands if you're interested. But that offers, I think, a good segue to lead us into the Windows registry. Yeah. Because when we were talking about that control panel window, the graphical user interface, and all that stuff is kind of a wrapper to really get the at front end, the core configuration settings. Yeah, yeah. A, a good front end for this beast. <laughs> the Wild West of the Windows registry. Uh, if you aren't familiar with the registry, uh, it's really a giant, giant dictionary and collection of configuration settings for Windows, for your operating system. Is that a fair encapsulation, Mendy, do you think? Yeah, it's it, it it that's basically it. Um, for those who know like networking SNMP, it's kind of like structured that way, almost. But I I, would, I usually call it a database, of because each one is its own separate database file that exists, um, and gets mounted as necessary. Uh, but it is a collection of settings that tell your computer how to run essentially. Um, those of you who are familiar with configuring group policy settings or even local security policy settings or even um, the GP edit, which is something else that they call it. I don't remember. Uh, each of those settings that you change, again, that's just a front end to the registry. Everything that you do adjusts something in registry, which is the back end and tells the computer how to behave. Um, so that's, that's a apt description, like a, a dictionary of settings and a you know, collection of stuff that tells the computer what to do. It is massive. No, uh, yeah. you'll, you'll see some cobwebs, you'll see some tumbleweeds. There uh, are a lot of corners and crevices in the registry, but you can do just about anything almost if, practically. If you know what you're doing, you yeah. can make the computer do things that you were not even aware were possible. <laughs> so if you want to risk breaking your computer, you can open it up with regedit. That's kind of the command to explore it in Windows. Uh, and you'll have that little window of the registry editor pop up. So. At a high level, all of these configuration settings live in hives. So you'll see an HKLM or an HKCU, and these are right. okay. HK local machine, excuse me, HK local machine or HK current user, right. etc. Inside of those, you have little folders, but those are kind of called keys. And then eventually, you'll drill down to the values and the real data inside those. Yep. Uh, those values might be set with a certain data type. Uh, okay, maybe it's a string, maybe it's binary, maybe it's a D word for some other assortment of bytes. But again, kind of as we said, just different representations of data. Of the same data. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Can we press the I believe button on the Windows registry? <laughs> <laughs> sure.
Sure, let's do it. So th- you can do so much with the registry. Uh, we see it in Huntress kind of all the time because you can be modifying services and startup tasks and auto runs and things. Uh, so hackers like to hide in there. But one thing that you could do. Oh, wait, 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 wait. At one Sorry. point. Sorry, wait, wait. I mean, we're just going to back up to the previous slide. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the two, pe- two people made comments here uh, in the chat. Ryan brought up HK- HKCU isn't real. Very good point. Hmm. Um, for those of you who are not aware, people like I know people who modify registry all the time and they don't really know what it is they're doing. HKCU is 100% not real. HKCU is a pointer to the HK users and what happens is, is that when the user logs in, their ntuser.dat file, which exists under their C users profile folder, that ntuser.dat file gets loaded into the HK users hive. Um, and we're going to see it live, apparently. Let's oh, sorry. Keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> and, what, and what we're going to see is that the current user maps to the existing session that registry editor gets launched under. Um, now, yeah, I called it registry editor instead of regedit because the next comment from Drew mentions regedit32.exe, which is a great point. Uh, for those of you who don't know how uh, 32-bit applications work on 64-bit OSs, there's, at least as far as Windows is concerned, uh, there's something called Windows on Windows, SysWow 64, and it is completely uh, not intuitive as to how that works. Thank you, Ryan. Yes, wow. This is wow. Windows on Windows. So the way it works is when you have, let's look at the program files folders on a 32-bit app, uh, computer, uh, 64-bit computer, you'll have program files and then you'll have program files x86. Okay, it's pretty straightforward. Any application that's running 64-bit will be under the program files folder. Any application that's running on the 32-bit is gonna run in the x86 folder. When you're talking about Windows binaries, <laughs> inside the Windows directory, things are a little bit different. So Anyone who knows anything about Windows can tell you that the system32 folder that exists inside of the Windows directory is important to you, right? It's important to Windows. If you, if you try deleting stuff from there and your computer is running, you're going to get failures on some, you're going to get successes on the other, your computer is not going to start up again. <laughs> it's just the way it works. But there's also, for 64-bit computers, a SysWow64. The SysWow64 folder is a location, Keep follow me here, for the 32-bit binaries to run that exists on Windows. So again, the program files x86 is where the 32-bit applications run, but the SysWow64 is where the 32-bit binaries run under Windows. So regedit32 specifically will open up the registry editor. Um, and if you can just pull that back up again for a second, yeah. John. I was uh, going to show the program files, but I was getting worried. You know, I might show some. PII yeah, don't do that house. here. Just <laughs> do you mind expanding software? Sure. In HK current user? Yeah, it doesn't matter. And then scroll all the way to the bottom. You can see all the crazy oh, yeah. weird so things. So right there, wow 6432 node. So there is a 32-bit set of settings that exist in registry. And if you open up regedit 32, it's gonna address the 32-bit keys, or alternatively, if you have the 64-bit one all the 32-bit keys get placed under WoW 6432 node. So if you actually go to HK Local Machine and then go to software, we'll see that uh, at the very bottom, again, we'll have a WoW 6432 node. And inside there, any application that runs on 32-bit, so anything that's running under program files x86 is going to be putting keys under the WoW 6432 node area. And anything that's 64-bit, we'll be putting it under the regular HK Local Machine software. Now, these are not like hard rules. This is, this is how it's designed. It doesn't mean it actually works that way. Bottom line is, is that a program can really do whatever it wants, assuming that um, it's a, not a true 32-bit only application. It does have the ability to address 64-bit area. And therefore, just because it, it exists in x86 folder, doesn't mean it has to go under the WoW 6432 uh, hives. But I think also that we've just spent enough time getting distracted from the main point. Um, that was just to answer two comments that were posted. Um, Drew posted more. There's not a 32 slash 64 bit registry currently. There were differences in one would do permissions and the other wouldn't. But these days, regedit32 just calls regedit. Okay, that's mm. interesting. It's good to know. 
Uh, Drew says that nowadays, if you call the 32 process, you're really just calling the, re the regular one. Um, and there were differences where you were able to change permissions, I guess, is what Drew's saying previously. And now the, there are no differences and it's just all the same. Are you trying um, to tell me that Microsoft has changed things? Yeah, that's, that's, that's strange. <laughs> wow, what a great transition. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Moving on to file associations and what Microsoft has changed. <laughs> so, yeah, we wanted to pitch this and maybe put together this cool, high-flying, fancy show where we're going to be the attacker and we're going to end up changing how one file is, is ended up being read or associated with a different program. Um, wouldn't it be really cool if we were to execute a picture or do something crazy where we clicked on an image file and all of a sudden, whatever malware, ransomware, blue skin of death. Uh, we kind of bebopped around with that idea um, and we wanted to make it realistic, right? We want to make it modern and current. So we were looking around and see how could we do this in Windows 10. Turns out you can't anymore. <laughs> So in the previous version of Windows, you could change kind of the file association settings in the registry when we were exploring and, and kind of walk, walking through those halls now. But in Windows 10, that hashes the association with to a user or a computer or timestamp, and it tries to prevent us finagling and getting in the way of that. Um, I can dig up that doc source that we saw. What do you think, Mandy? Um, it's it's there's a lot of conversations online about it. I wouldn't necessarily go digging for the doc source, <laughs> <laughs> but I spent I spent a, a long weekend trying to get around it. There are so many articles. Uh, this one guy created a um, created an application that would create the hash for you, uh, so that you were able to. And then it just didn't end up working. And then he posted an update. Oh yeah, Windows. Microsoft broke this in version 1806 of Windows 10. So you know, um, they, we, we tried a lot to make this work. But the thing is, and to stress this a little bit more, is that there was, in, it used to be in Windows XP seven days, that there was not just, you know, like you can right click on a file and tell it to open, or you can tell it to edit, or you can tell it to print, right? These are all different options available in the context menu that were controlled in the registry. Like the registry would tell, what command to execute, what application to call with what parameters based off of what you actually selected on that context menu. Um, so what I was really hoping to do what John and I first dreamed up was just modifying those options so that we can literally open a picture file and then have some program running, like, like John said, execute an image file. Um, and then it turned out that we can't modify that anymore due to Microsoft changes. So. Uh, instead, I took a different route and I figured, let's stop thinking of a hacker and let me just do this as a regular end user. <laughs> and I just modified the association manually as a regular user just to showcase an example of what we mean here. Um, and that brings us to the live demo. Yeah. So hope, all hope is not lost. We still have some cool magic tricks to show you. Um, and maybe you can kind of see what's up our sleeve as you're watching. Uh, for some of you uber lead hacks or as we can kind of see what we're looking at. I will uh, close this out and bring me to my desktop. And I have a simple PDF file here on my desktop, aptly named a simple PDF file. And if I were to open this simple PDF file, we'll pray to the demo gods and hopefully I didn't get this wrong here. Oh, wow. Look at that. We have a simple PDF file. I like this uh, lorem ipsum task text here. Yeah, I actually went and Googled for a PDF example file and I got a bunch of different variations with like images and whatnot. So I just downloaded the simplest one. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Very cool. So there you go. I mean, that's the end of the show. We got a simple PDF file and, and that's that, <laughs> right? Wrong. So if I were to have this simple PDF file and if I were to right click it and rename it, We'll just change this to something innocent, something kind of benign, something harmless. We'll make this a simple text file, right? Hey, Windows will tell me because it 
prefers to work off of those file extensions. If you change a file name extension, it might become unusable. Are you really sure you want to do that? Let's do it. So now I have a simple PDF file.txt and I'll click on it to open it up and maybe start notepad, but ooh, uh, this- What just happened, John? This is the, the flashy, super incredible- like, I feel like well, I just executed a text file. What happened? <laughs> How did that work? Thank I don't you understand. For, <laughs> thank you for your suspended disbelief, Mendy. <laughs> we should go on tour here. Uh, yeah, right. So what we've got is a simple hello world program, right? Just showing a proof of concept and a prompt here, press enter to continue, well, much like the pause command, like you would see you, if you were- hmm? can, you, can you do something for me, John? Can you open up Notepad and then just yeah. open that file directly through Notepad? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I want to see what's inside. The, what are the contents of this file? So I got, I got Notepad open up here. So right. I'll open, and mm -hmm. then hopefully there's nothing too scary on <laughs> my computer. <laughs> A simple well, PDF file.txt. Okay, so we go. wait, what the heck? So here, let me make that a little bit bigger so we can see it. So what I'm seeing is that it's it's just PowerShell commands in an, in a text file. Like it's literally the right host. Hello, what if what if you change this? Can you make this say something else? Yeah, I wanted to make it like super scary where I could pop some interpreter shell. Okay, uh, <laughs> but we're gonna water it down and just open up the calculator. <laughs> oh man, we don't want to like execute a web request or something and come back with your public IP address. Yeah. <laughs> so now let's open up our text file, right? Hey, there's calc. Oh man. Good proof of concept, right? When you pop calc, it's like popping a shell. So what we're seeing is that we just modified a text file and then we're opening it up, but instead of actually opening notepad, it's just executing the commands we placed inside, right? Yes. Imagine if that was like a real executable, uh, it could be either like, like actual binary, <laughs> you know, and, and it's a text file, people aren't realizing they would just be opening an actual program. Does anyone know the uh, PowerShell fork bomb off the top of their head? I think it's like a start job, get job, something crazy. I don't, I don't know it, honestly. I know it in Bash, but not in PowerShell. I mean, Whatever. you should be able to call command <laughs> if, you want, <laughs> if you really wanted to. <laughs> um, cool. So how does this work? John, how, how, how does that, how does it that when you're opening the text file that it's actually executing? Yeah, so we will pull back our sleeves here and we'll kind of show you the magic trick. Um, if I were to right click and open with, right, to change the file handle, uh, or what's gonna end up actually associating the program there, like sure, we could open this up in Notepad kind of as we've done. It looks like a regular plain text file, but the magic trick that's happening here is that we have crafted a program handler. And that's just gonna be an executable that kind of knows what we're doing here. That has been set up with the ploy. That's kind of our, our hacker malware, quote unquote, that's allowing us to execute it and run that code, run that script. Let's, let's rename it back to PDF. Don't run that. Let's, run, let's rename it back to PDF. Okay. And then yeah. what happens if we run it with our program handler? Let's How do it. How does that work? We'll open with that program handler. Oh, but there's our PDF. We have our PDF back. Spooky. Can we open up the PDF in Notepad again? Let's just, let's pull up Notepad and reopen that file. Sure. Do I still have Notepad running? I do. So now we're going to open up I don't have a .txt file extension anymore, so I gotta right. tell Notepad, let's get all files, but there's our PDF. So let's open that back up. Ah, uh, it's what PDF. Happened? <laughs> <laughs> this is our PDF signature, guys, by the way. This is the, uh, it is the same file, Wes. It's literally the same exact file. <laughs> it's the same file, Wesley. <laughs> so that's our magic trick. How did, how did we do this? That's the question, right? Have we blown your mind? Have we set off the fireworks that we wanted to today? Notepad is really hurting on these non-printable characters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this is exactly what we're talking about, the different data types that can or can't display, right? This is all, this is, this is, well, some of it is plain text that controls like how the PDF displays font or, or page breaks or whatever. And then other, other things are just actual binary that goes, that displays the, the data inside. Um, 
Oh, I see some folks in the chat getting concerned about this desktop icon. Let's, on my... let's pull up command prompt. Let's just pull up command prompt for one second. Sure. <laughs> CMD. Do you want an administrator command prompt? No, no, no. I don't need right, an administrator. Right. <laughs> so we're in your user's directory right now, right? Yep. So let's, yep. let's just alleviate some concerns here. Um, let's go one folder in. Let's go into the desktop folder, CD desktop. Let's do it. And do you mind doing a dir start.pdf PDF forward slash s? Uh, say that one more time. <laughs> star.pdf. And it's going to search your desktop and all subfolders for any PDF that exists. So you want the slash s? Slash s, yep. Alrighty. Is that, are you going to have any files there you don't want people to see? Just my dog's medical history. <laughs> <laughs> The only thing there we can just search for the whole name is the is one file on the root of the desktop. A simple PDF, and we can do the same thing with a text file as well. Yeah. Um, and now we'll we see, might have some weird stuff. Who knows? <laughs> you want to just do the whole name? Uh, quotation marks a space simple whatever. Sure, I'll do a. And we'll make that Our recursive. Sashes. Doesn't exist. Uh, file. Uh, mm. Just add a star at the end. Oh, it's because it's a PDF. It's a PDF, right? right. It's a, the text file doesn't exist. It's not two different files here, guys. It's the same exact file. But I appreciate your your dedication. <laughs> you guys were doing real detective work, and we even found my dog's medical history. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Have we have we convinced you that it is one simple file? Let's Where do one other thing one? while we're here. By the way, just yeah. minimize this command prompt. Sure. Let's close out this Notepad for a second. Sure. Let's rename this back to txt and run it again. All righty. Dot and txt. Then, yep, run it again. We'll double click it here. Ooh, how do we want to open this text file? It doesn't, this is, the, this is the part that we got kept getting issues with. Did, I'm wondering if you have a space somewhere. Does that make sense? It's Maybe. Not recognizing it, but this is the problem that we had because Windows 10, the, since the hash isn't recognized, so it reprompts the user as to how to do it. Okay, so we have the file back to a not a PDF file, obviously, it's, it's a script. If we go back to the other command prompt and just rerun your last dir command. So looking for that text oh, file? I, I was just gonna do the regular, just a dir in, a, in the current folder. Sure. And the size of the file has changed. We're dealing with the same exact file here. So the question is, where does where is the hello world code gone? Where does it go? What happens to it? Right. That's a, here's the magic trick, and and the key is. Um, oh, we're blowing well, people's minds in the chat. Re renaming <laughs> the file changed its size. <laughs> the the key that we're dealing we're dealing with the, the magic that we did is called alternative data streams, uh, otherwise known as ADS. Although that can sometimes get confused with Active Directory services, but it's not Active Directory services. It's alternative data streams. And the program handler is really just a PowerShell script that was created that we can uh, bring up and showcase the code, I think is where John's going. And you can see clearly what happens here. All we're doing is we're taking the parameter of the file name with, and this is how Windows works, right? So when you execute a, a file, when you when you double click on a file that's associated to a program, all it's doing is that it's calling that file that that program and passing the file path to that program. So we have a parameter file name that gets passed to the PowerShell script. Um, we skip that first if section; it just makes sure we actually got a file path, um, and then we're testing that path to make sure the file exists, and then we're checking to see what extension that file is. Now we're, we're not doing some kind of swap of like stealing data from another file and putting it in or anything like that. That's not what we're doing here. We're using the same exact file and we're using alternative streams of that file in order to store the data that we want. So the very first thing that we do if the file is called .pdf and it gets executed by the program handler, it's gonna read that file's alternate stream called the PDF stream, literally, um, actually, sorry, no, it's called PDF file, the variables PDF stream. And it's gonna pull that content out, that raw content, because it can't read it. It's not, it's binary, some of it, right? So we have to make sure we pull the raw content out and it's gonna replace the primary stream with that value. 
So that's literally what it's doing. It's actually converting. It's pulling the data out from one hidden stream and making that the primary stream. And then it's starting the PDF file, which is just executing the PDF handler. Uh, in this case, Google Chrome. Yeah, the real PDF handler. The real PDF handler, exactly. Uh, and then what we did for a text extension was we did something a little scarier. We're just getting the content of that stream. You know, we're replacing it. We're replacing the mainstream with that on purpose because we want to be able to show you that we can edit the file and then execute whatever lines we put in that. Um, and then all it's doing is it's just pulling that code and it's uh, invoking the expression. It's literally just running PowerShell off the contents of that file. Yeah, sorry, I did the short hand. Oh, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's the magic behind of what we just did. So if you go back to, um, go back to, pull up that command prompt again. Sure. Uh, oh, I sorry, I had you close it. I, that's I didn't all right. close it. Um, and this time, execute PowerShell. So just run PowerShell in here. And we're going to get dash item. Do you want me to hop into your desktop? Uh, yeah, sorry. You're good. And then grab that item by name. So it's get dash item. Yep. And then add a, uh, at the end of it, add the attribute or the property dash stream. I think it might be mm -hmm. stream. So auto complete that if you can, or, okay, stream. it's stream. All right. And then just do space star. So we're going to pull all the streams that exist for this file. And you can see clearly how there's a PDF file stream that's right in the middle. And the size of that, of that stream, how much data is stored inside of it is by length. And the primary stream, which is above that, is just literally dollar sign data. Uh, is 34 bytes, which matches the last stream that we have, the text file, which is 35 bytes. I'm not sure why it's one byte extra, but whatever. <laughs> I'm not complaining. Maybe some new line or whatever. Yeah. Um, but it is. I mean, in a text file, literally every character you put in a text file is one byte. That's how that's how it comes up to. So it probably is just like a new line or a space or something like that at the end of it. Um, and all we're doing in our program handler is just swapping this out. But it's not a big deal for um, for a, a malicious person to like hide something inside of an alternative stream or even inside the same exact file. You know, if they were able to encode it correctly, that it doesn't it doesn't uh, affect the main application. So if they open their PDF, they still see <laughs> exactly. Now we have a bad guy stream. Or I might have I, just nerfed you, it. You, I think you nerfed it all, yeah, because you're in PowerShell, not command. <laughs> oh, demo gods. It's OK. Just, it, just exit, so you're back <laughs> in command, and rerun the same command. No, 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 no. Type in the exit command. So you're still in command prompt. Yeah, and then just execute, copy, paste that command. And that should work, I think. Now let's see how I can get back into PowerShell. I might have just nerfed all the other streams, <laughs> You've definitely completely did. destroying our demo. Yeah, but we still have the bad guy, so it doesn't <laughs> matter. Um, and the other thing is, if you let's say so, let's drop back out into command prompt because I don't know how to do this in PowerShell. But sure. uh, type in Notepad, and then the name of the file. So just you can auto complete that. Oh, I gotta get to my desktop. Uh, desktop. Yeah, and then colon bad guy at the end. I think should run. Ta-da. I don't know if that worked correctly or not. I might have, yeah, maybe my syntax was wrong with the echo to, to add in that that evilness, but. Um, yeah, so uh, change this to something else. Just change it back to like hello world or main file. And then close it out. Put the colon bad guy inside the quotes. Let's see what happens. I don't know if this is gonna work or not. Mm, no. It doesn't work, yeah, because it has the quotes. <laughs> This is why you should never have spaces in your file names, people. Yeah, Unix exactly. philosophy. So that way you can we can do bad stuff to you. Um, but the bottom line is, is that we can we can extract code and run it on any type of file. It can be a picture file, it can be a, P, a PDF file, an audio file, and it doesn't have to impact how the file behaves clearly, uh, like we've just seen. Mendy had brought up a really cool point as we were kind of 
bumping around with this idea uh, is because like we, the way that we kind of hot swapped and we did a little sleight of hand with those alternate data streams, well, that could, we, we could kind of morph that at, at any point. So if it were a PDF or some image, you, you would give the example of a coupon, Mendy. Right. And someone said like, hey, I want to hold on to this. I want to save this. And maybe sometime later, okay, once I'm home, I can go print it out and go use that coupon at the store. Well, what if we were to latch onto the functionality of printing? And then we'll execute our malicious code. Then we'll drop our whatever ransomware, exfil, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. I thought that was kind of neat. Yeah. I mean, again, so it's all about um, creativity, honestly. Like that's, that's, that's really what gets these people through your, through your defenses is, you know, who, who's more creative <laughs> at, at whatever's going on because everything that happens is an execution of some sort. Opening a program is an execution of a process that calls that file, right? Um, performing a print function is literally execution of the process. You know, for those of you, those of you who going back to 3264 bit for a second, you know, everyone knows, I think, I hope what the principal or service is, right? That's the spool SV. But what they don't know is that the SPL wow 64 process that runs when you're a 32 bit application attempting to print, right? Cause that's the handler that does the transition of the raster data between the 32 bit application and the 64 bit print driver, and that's how it's able to print. So Thomas Buckley asks, does most modern AV engines scan for and or detect alternate data streams? Yes, I hope so. I'll, additionally, they're not as vulnerable as how we made it appear, right? So I, I'm not a master hacker or anything like that. I'm very far from that. Um, and I picked on something that we can easily demo, but wouldn't necessarily be useful uh, by itself in the real world. Um, so John had mentioned when I gave him the file <laughs> that was modified and he downloaded it from the web, it, act it had actually stripped out the uh, alternate data streams. Um, so to answer your question, even if most AV engines don't scan for, it seems like any external file you download would pull the stream out. Uh, primarily alternate data streams are used to store uh, metadata about a file and Primarily, it's not even for NTFS. Like NTFS supports it for files that come from other file systems, uh, from the research that I was able to see. Um, so hopefully that alleviates any concerns we brought to you, Thomas. <laughs> I am uh, running Defender, and it's on right now, kind of on my Windows host. But obviously, we aren't working with anything actually spooky, scary. Yeah, right. we popped up in the calculator application. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if we had some invoke Mimi cats or whatever meterpreter shell code callback, maybe right. it would trigger. Uh, again, I'll probably have to leave that as an exercise for the reader. Um, but hey, we still want to play. We still want to learn and, and tinker with this too. So yeah. The recap though, on our magic trick, on that little sleight of hand fireworks there, uh, what we had done knowing that we couldn't manipulate those registry key associations in Windows 10, is that, well, we just kind of latched on to the functionality that we can set our own file association as needed. So we created the program that would handle it. We had our own custom program handler and that would toggle or flip flop in and out whether we were going to show you an actual PDF file or we were going to execute code under the guise that we were a simple text file. Uh, you could do so much more with this kind of, as we said, like, yeah, that could be a PNG image. That could be a video file. That could be an MP3 song. Uh, we did that kind of abusing the alternate data streams. And we didn't kind of dive into or, or talk about that a lot in the buildup to demo, like in the presentation slides in the lecture portion. Uh, but we can certainly chat about that more in the question and answer or just have kind of a informal banter. Um, but we can kind of start to wrap this up unless you think there's more to, to dive into on that, Mandy. Um, no, I think it's a perfect segue to the uh, humans trust even when they shouldn't, right? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I tried to play it up when we were doing that show, right? When I said, oh, we'll rename it to something simple, innocent and benign, just a text file. And we had the icon change so it looked believable, right. but we're lying to you. It's all a farce, <laughs> it's artifice. Uh, so we say like, hey, be vigilant, be, be, be vigilant, be on your guard for this kind of thing because the hacker, the threat actor, the bad guy, they want to 
lay this mouse trap for you to walk into. They're going to deceive you. They've got decoys and they'll play their game of deception. Uh, that's something that we kind of need to be aware of. And I, the zero trust approach buzzwords, I felt like was somewhat appropriate, but also gets watered down because it's a buzzword. What, what say you in that regard, Mendy? <laughs> yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I, I've come across uh, the five laws of cybersecurity when Nick Espinoza was talking about them um, for in, in the ConnectWise IT Nation Secure. Um, he, he was a speaker there and he's, he's a very good speaker. <laughs> um, and he wrote this article and, and this thing about the five laws of cybersecurity, which he essentially built from his explanation of how would I explain security so that my own mother would understand it. And then that way, if I can explain it to my mother, I can explain it to anyone because she's not an end user. Or she's not a computer got a person in any way, shape or form. And as he's explaining the laws, I'm thinking in my head, like this is not just for non-techie people. Like this is for techie people too. There's so many different things that you don't consider necessarily when you're talking about security and the five laws breaks it out into one very big law that essentially says, don't trust anything. Everything's always going to be hacked and you always do your best to stay in front of it by being less hackable than the guy next to you. <laughs> that's, that's really it. Those are how the, how the, how the five laws are broken down to. Um, and yeah, John, if you want to just, there you go. Gotcha. <laughs> Paste the link. Um, but, and that's it. That's, this is a definite read. I would recommend um, for those of you who don't know Nick Espinoza, I would recommend looking him up. And uh, law number five, was it? Or uh, three, law number three, three sorry. Is us, yep. Yeah, humans trust even when they shouldn't uh, is the key that we're talking about on this set demo is like, people are gonna get a PDF file. It's gonna be a coupon to some restaurant they want or you know, buy one, get one free or whatever it is. And they, or even a cat video, right? Everyone trusts cats, you know? <laughs> so they're gonna download this thing and now they're leaving potential payload of malware on their computer so that they can open it up when they want to and look at it. And then some time over a weekend, some other vulnerability executes that goes looking for that file that they know is there because they know it was downloaded and it contains malicious code inside that's not found by antivirus because it's not an executable, <laughs> you know? And then um, that, that, that can be potentially a, a very good and bad way in. Um, so yeah, that, that law number three was what came to mind when uh, John's like, oh, we will call it zero trust, uh, zero trust. And I was like, that's too buzzwordy. Like people aren't going to put two and two together. Let's, let's just try something else here. Um, so that's what I think. <laughs> cool. I think that's a good, good mix and hopefully, hopefully captures kind of what we're getting across here. But yeah. All righty. With, uh, with five minutes left on the clock. We're happy to uh, chat a little bit more about it and, and open this up. So what do you think? How'd we do? I, I had some fun. I don't know. I, I think it was good. I think it was good. I, I know that there's two questions that uh, weren't, answer, weren't asked in the question module, but Wesley asked whether or not, just to confirm, if the ADS gets transferred when downloading a file. We have not tested this enough to definitively say yes or no either way. Uh, what we can say is when I transferred the file to John over Slack and he downloaded it, the ADS was not present and he had to rebuild it. Um, in terms of Andy's question, uh, why doesn't Windows use the magic number slash file header information? Great question. We have applications that if you, so that happens if you have a PDF and you open it up in let's say image editor or photo viewer or something like that, you're gonna get a message that's gonna say this file's corrupt or let's say, let's take it one step further and say we try opening a PNG file in Word. Word is going to say, this is not a recognized Word document that we can open, right? So Word has built-in signature rec uh, recognition where it'll know what type of file to open. Taking that one step further, let's talk about two formats that Word can open, okay? So Word can open doc or docx, RTF, or many other formats. Let's say we have an RTF file, okay? If I were to rename that RTF file to doc, doc and open it in Word, it's going to open just fine. Because <laughs> Word is going to do automatic signature detection on the file and say, oh, I can open this file and it's going to display properly. Whereas if you have a, a doc file and try opening it in Adobe Reader, you're going to get back nothing. It's going to say, sorry, this file is corrupt. 
So Windows does not use the file signatures inherently or natively, I should say. The applications do when they open it. They, that's how they know whether or not the file is corrupt. Um, sometimes you'll get an image file that opens up just fine without saying it's corrupt, but part of the image may be missing. <laughs> It's clearly a corrupt image file because it's missing data, but the signature is fine and the checksum worked out. So it's not considered a corrupt file. Um, and, and really that's, that's the problem. Windows natively won't recognize the signature. It's gonna rely on the association on the file extension to determine what application to open. But I think Microsoft, if they were to be, I don't know, smart, uh, <laughs> there, there are probably reasons why they haven't done this yet, but they could build in a detection algorithm that says, hey, this is this type of file. Let's open your default handler for that file type instead of looking at the extension itself. Cool. I think we're I closing think into it. the end here. Well, hey, I hope you had fun. I think I had a lot of fun. I, I really did. enjoyed kind of the show and I, and I hope you guys kind of in the chat had, had some fun with it too. Uh, please don't be a stranger. If you want to chat about this or MSP geek or Huntress or anything, just need someone to talk to. Hey, uh, I, you can cyber stalk me and you can probably find me pretty easily. <laughs> yeah. And if you have any questions for me, uh, I'll be on MSP geek Slack or on the forums um, or you know, most of you are probably already on MSP Geek anyways. So if you're not, you should be. So you can find me there. All righty. I think we're just at the top of the hour so we can tune out. But thank you so, so much, everyone, for, for coming to hang out with us. Um, thanks again. Take care. Do a classic wave goodbye. Bye, yeah, right. everyone. <laughs> <laughs> goodbye, goodbye. Thanks, all. Oh.